Good day, good folks. You are listening to Talk That Keeps You Woke. And with your awakening, we hope that you will take in the information and knowledge we provide. So make sure you like and subscribe while you hop on this ride as we inform, persuade, entertain, and engage in discussion. Welcome to Pot Liquor Podcast, which is knowledge to feed your soul. I make up one half of Pot Liquor. I go by Dr. A, the inquisitive one. A great debater, Mr. Slow Talker, a rhetorician, and an all-around nice guy, and a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. The other half of Potlicker is my homie, my dear friend for more than 30 years, Kim Parker Jackson Esquire, the legal one, Mrs. Creativity, never obnoxious, the gifted one, a terrific lady, and a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Well, we're back in the saddle. How you doing, partner? How was your week? Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I am well. My week was amazing. And it's funny you said we're back in the saddle because I have on my cowboy hat in honor of Miss Carter. Okay. Explain. Miss Carter. A lot of, okay. There you go. I was about <laughs> to say that might have went over a lot of people's heads. Um, my week was cool. Uh, first week back after spring break. Um, the students are still, they were a little lethargic, um, even though they didn't do anything over spring break. Uh, but you know, when you come back, when you play the role as an instructor in class, um, you have to be more than just, you know, a teacher, you know, you have to be a, a preacher, a counselor, a motivated speaker. You have to do a lot these days to motivate the kids but those of you who watch our show always know we start off with the wow of the week and this one comes from an oldie but goodie but sister harriet tubman and she says i had reasoned this out in my mind there was one of two things i had a right to liberty or death if i could not have one I would have the other. So basically, she's saying, you know, freedom of death. Um, and we all know the history of Sister Harriet. Um, she was a conductor of the Underground Railroad for years um, and took successful journeys taking black bodies from the South and bringing them up to the North so they could have their freedom, you know. And she never lost the slave doing her travels. Um, and this, she was basically saying, I'll die for my freedom, you know? Um, and I understand that. Um, it's hard for us who live in today's times to say how we would have carried or conducted ourselves back in the antebellum, you know, doing slavery, um, giving all the, uh, the evil and the detrimental things they did to us um but it's a bold statement to know like i would like to say i would because of my personality and who i am i would stand in the same shoes as she did what say you i agree wholeheartedly with everything that you said and the only thing that i would add is that when i when i think of this quote and i think of harriet tubman what i think of is one word and that is agency she is demonstrating to us with this quote that she had agency over her life in such a tough time when she uh, conducted the Underground Railroad. She decided it was either going to be freedom or death. And she would decide which one it was going to be. And it reminds me of the song with the lyrics, and before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to live with Jesus and be free. So I can certainly relate to what Sister Tubman is saying to us. We must have agency over our lives and we must have a reason to live. Okay, that's well put. And let us move on.
All right. We have a new guest. Not new to me. I grew up with this young man. He has gone on to achieve a lot of different things. And like me, he is a huge fan of hip hop. And we are going to get into a conversation about hip hop music. One of my favorite bars in hip hop to me to, that explains hip hop. If someone says, what does hip hop mean to you? I will go, wait. Hip-hop music, you like it cause you choose it. Most DJs won't refuse it. A lot of sucker MCs misuse it. It ain't nothing like hip-hop music. You like it cause you choose it. Most DJs won't refuse it. A lot of sucker MCs misuse it. That is Stetson Sonic, right? Go Stetson. That's an oldie but goodie, but that's one of my favorite songs. That is the first rap group to use uh, uh, the band like instead of just the dj um and they were from brooklyn new york and they had a lot of they they were very i would say good song writers like the structures if you listen to their songs like sally you know we use sally as one of our drops here um it's you know they had everything together their dj also discovered de la so dj paul so I'm going back into some history of hip hop music, but we're going to talk about hip hop music today. Um, we there are artists out there named you know Sexy Red, if y'all know Megan the Stallion, who graduated from Texas Southern University, so she is a tiger, and Cardi B, who has the famous song WAP, and a lot of my students, uh, they waver on the content of the song um, and how they feel about it. But like I said, some, there was not, there was a little difference when we were growing up, but we still had those songs. And a lot of my friends would say, no, nah, Tay, we didn't have those songs. And I just go exhibit A, Akinelli, right? That was one of the most, it's still today, I would say one of the most, vile hip hop songs i guess but it still knocks and what i mean by that is the songs take on different meanings depend depending on what space you're in so if you at a party you know a center party and these songs come on or if you at a club and these songs come on or at a big picnic where there's a dj and these songs come on you know we we dance to things that the lyrics are not always the best things to hear, but we still like the music. So I'm not one of these hypocritical uh, <laughs> instructors that say to my students, y'all listening to trash today. No, it's their time. Um, I am not the demographic anymore. I understand that. Um, or do I like some of the artists, musical artists today, most of the musical artists today that I like are more underground and not mainstream. And I like that they have the courage to be underground, even though the industry is definitely kind of head. The music industry is headed in that direction. So without further ado, uh, he is being humble, but he is a PhD too. Uh, Dr. Raphael Travis, um, affectionately known in our neighborhood as Junior. Uh, what's up, man? How you been? I'm great, man. Life is good. No complaints. I appreciate the invite to to be on this platform with y'all. It's good to see you, man. Yeah. It's been a minute. Yeah, it's been a minute. Tell the people before we get started. Um, uh, by the way, a lot of people back at home or who used to live in our neighborhood watch this, so they, they might be seeing you for the first time in a while. Um, tell them, you know, your your background, you know, your education and where you where you stay now, where you teach at now. Let's just let the folks know who you are. Yeah, well, I guess we can start from the beginning. Born and born and raised uh, Long Island, Strong Island, as we call it. Uh, mm -hmm. I was born in Hempstead, moved to Roslyn, Laurel Street when I was five. Uh, grew up there, graduated, went away to school uh, at Virginia and uh Kept on. I like school so much. I kept kept going. Oh, yeah. um, but uh, I went to Michigan for social work. I was a practicing social worker in the D.C. area, uh, Baltimore and D.C. area. 
And, um, you know, I, I wanted to continue to work with young people, but I wanted to work a little bit more broadly. And so I uh, went to I uh, went to school at, at UCLA for public health, uh, community health uh, in particular, and, you know, focused on youth program. And that's really where my heart was. How can we think about designing programs that, you know, can help young people be the best versions of themselves? You know, I, was, I wasn't interested in like, how do we fix kids, but how do we invest in young people? How do we create opportunities where they can, you know, really plug in and, and lo- learn and grow and, and things like that. Um, right now, I'm at Texas State University in the School of Social Work. Um, I was, I just stepped down. I was the director of the graduate program um, for the last four years, but now I'm just back in the classroom focusing on my research and um, the, the things that I look at, which I, I was excited when you invited me on because hip hop is a big part of what I focus on, right? It's thinking of, about how do we connect hip hop culture to well being, um, whether it's through formal programs, whether it's through informal uh, you know, workshops and just helping people think about the role of hip hop in their life and um, how it can help them learn and grow. Uh, that's interesting. Being that you just said that, have can you tell us about like any projects or seminars you had or discussions that kind of relate to what you just told us? Yeah. So um, I just came back from a um, workshop in Brooklyn, as a matter of fact, with the uh, Brooklyn Justice in- Initiatives uh, last weekend. So I was happy to get home. I got, got to get some pizza, got to get some cheesecake, uh, you know, all, all the stuff we love from New York. But, um, you know, it's, it's those types of workshops that I do a lot. And this was working with um, young adults that uh, they were involved in the, in the criminal justice system, Um, They didn't have felonies, so they were, you know, kind of participating in diversion type programs. So this was uh, a two day workshop uh, with beat makers and really helping them to write music, uh, you know, make some beats um, and then explore lyrics and think about, you know, how, you know, how certain songs help them connect with aspects of what's going on in their life and, you know, help them think differently and, you know, got to talk about certain things and they got to make some dope beats too. Um, But I do a lot of that type stuff Um, in the school of social work. We have a studio, full studio uh, with six stations. Um, And so, you know, a lot of my work is, is based on, on both sides. So how can we use existing art, right. To think about ourselves, the world, um, you know, motivate us to kind of be at our best. Um, But then also on the creative side, right? How can we help people, whether it's, you know, writing lyrics, making beats, uh, you know, mixing, um, but how can they use the art as a form of uh, expression and creativity? Um, Yeah. That sounds super interesting, man. I got to make my way up to uh, Texas State. Yeah, Uh, come on down, man. I'm not that far from you and see what you got going on there. I like the sound of that. With that being said, there are some things, when I talk about hip hop, I like the good, the bad, and the ugly. I have to be honest. I I can't always defend the the bad and the ugly. Um, I can express concern about it, um, but I do do appreciate the art. Um, And all three of us are at the age where we're sophisticated enough to determine like what's real and what's not real. But what's going on today that is hard for me to take is the drill music, not because of the music itself. You know, T.I. just had a joke um, because y'all, if y'all don't know, he's, you know, on comedy tours now, as well as he's still doing this hip hop. But he just had a joke. He said him, Jeezy, and he said somebody else, I forgot the name, like, when they came into hip hop, they wrote about what they experienced, where they are, and how they're trying to make a way out. He said today's rappers are rapping about what they're going to do tomorrow, and it's violent. So the drill music, if, if those who don't know, is just is very combative. And then these, some of these, and I don't want to put it on all drill rapping artists. Some of these artists go out and um, actually do 
what they say they're doing, which leads to, again, the old, you know, uh, one brother killing another brother or Hispanic or what have you. Um, I think that is definitely detrimental. How would, if they called you in to say, hey, man, uh, Dr. Travis, we, we got to do something about this. What would be your approach, like your, your process? Well, I think, you know, with a lot of this, we romanticize our our eras of music. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> me and my friends, we always joke, like, when when you think about, you know, back in the days when they talk about backpack rap, right, mm -hmm. you know, Black Moon and all that kind of stuff. But listen to the lyrics. That, that I love Black Moon. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But listen to what they were talking about. You know, each and every day, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. <laughs> every brother in sight, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you know, yeah, think about the know. early nineties, yeah. think about what was going on then, you know, and, and violence was at an all time high. That was the highest violence has ever been like way more than it is now. Yeah. So I, do, you, I do, think, do you think that violence back then was triggered by the hip hop? No, uh, it was triggered uh, by by uh, the hip -hop. SES. It was tr tr triggered by what was going on in society. Yeah, okay. You know, and so I, it, it was it was a it was a bad you know stew of a lot of things, and yeah. and and hip hop reflected what was going on. Right. So, but yeah. I think I think that was also coincided with the time where hip hop became a, a product, a commodity, and and I think the trickle down effect has is now whereas like the stuff that we that you you're talking about that we hear for me I, the only difference that i think is that that is portrayed as that is hip hop that's all is hip hop that's what yeah. that's what you hear when kids turn on the radio they'll hear on their way to school whereas before that wasn't the case you know what i'm saying so i think that's the challenge yeah, I like the word when you said reflected because I think the hip hop back then was like a soundtrack uh, to what was going on in in society, and I think a lot of the hip hop artists try to emulate the drug dealers of that time. You know, the the, the images that the drug dealers had with the big gold ropes and chains and things of that nature. You know, um, I think it it. it, it it kind of influenced the the rap culture. And, and I do agree with you. That's when labels, independent labels got bought out by huge conglomerates. And then that changed the tone and the message of the music. I'm not going to hog this up. I'm going to let my partner get you a question. Oh, well, I'm, I'm just enjoying the conversation. But I, I did uh, wonder for Dr. Travis, how do you measure the success of the kind of programs that you um, that you have for the community? How do you measure the success of that? And do you have any particular story that you can talk about to demonstrate that? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I wanna just put a period on that last part with the thinking about, thinking about how hip hop was and how it is now. I think the other final thing that's important about that is in that era, like you were talking about Shantae, am I calling you Shantae or Dr. Dr. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it don't matter. We're family. <laughs> right. um, is that, you know, during that period, because things were so rough, a lot of what was reflected was that by any means necessary to survive attitude, you know, I gotta, I gotta do what I gotta do out here and that message became the message that this generation grew up with as the message mm. and and these are our kids like they are a byproduct of us as as adults as parents and so they had to grow up in those environments with us doing whatever we had to do to get by and so i think that's a, a that's another thing that is being reflected like they they're mirroring us you know what i mean um and i think that's important and, and i think we have to take accountability of that these are our children 
So you mean wow. mirroring us in real life or imitating mirroring, the art? No, mirroring our this, uh, the, the attitude of by any means necessary. Okay, or get Survival. rich and die trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I got to get mine, you know, because of what is presented to us in society. You know what okay. I'm saying? Um, and I think, and and it's 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 not necessarily a, a fault. It's the it's the reality. That's the reality we portray, right? Um, you know, uh, re- resilience is a good thing, but you know, one of the things that you know, I talk a lot about is like how you, how do you cope? You know what I mean? Like what are what are the what are the methods that you are using? to make it through these really challenging times. And so I think we're being confronted with a lot of the strategies that we used have, can have certain impacts that, that aren't always the greatest, but, um, but I, I love the question on measurement. Um, that's a, another hat that I wear a lot as a researcher, right? So both trying to understand the science, like what, what is it that we connect to in the culture that is helpful um, as well as what's harmful, right? That's that's a big part of it too. What got me into it as a researcher was from that perspective. Like I felt, um, I, I didn't feel, but it was like a lot of people looking at how do we use hip hop and or ha- what role does hip hop play in our life fell into two camps. Like one is hip hop is in rock and roll at the time. Hip hop and rock and roll are the worst things ever. That's what researchers were looking at. Like what are the negative effects of of heavy metal and and hip hop. Um, that was the early research. Um, and then we also have research on the other side. Um, you know, hip hop is the greatest thing in the world. It's going to save us all. But I felt like people weren't really asking the question of, can both of those things coexist? In what ways can the way that we engage the culture be helpful? And in what ways that we engage the culture be potentially harmful or in, in the words that I use, how can it be empowering and how can it be risky? Um, and so that was kind of like the first foray into looking at this. Uh, and then once, you know, we started to better understand, you know, the ways that it's, it's helpful, then we move into, okay, now that we know some of these things, how can we create some programs and strategies that, um, that allow us to promote what's most empowering and and inhibit the things that are are risky, um, and so that that was one of the first from a measurement standpoint is how do we articulate helpful or empowering, uh, and so so the first kind of layer of my work was identifying that it's um, and, it, and it falls into these five five areas of empowerment. Um, related to esteem, resilience, growth, community, and social change. Those are the things that are, um, that, that those are the positives. Those are the helpful things that we get out of, um, out of engaging hip hop. <clears throat> um, so that's the first part from a measurement size, just to be able to consistently show that when we talk to people, when we ask people, what do they get out of it? Those themes keep showing up. So that's the first measurement point that we can consistently point to when asked, like, how is it helpful? Helps me feel better. Helps me cope with challenging things. Helps me think about being the best version of myself. Help me belong to the groups that are important to me. Helps me think about improving the conditions um, in society of things that I don't think are, are right, you know? So we can consistently point to that as a measurement outcome. Um, but then moving to, I think what you were asking about is, how do we know that the programs, the things that we are or we're using that we're trying to create empowering experiences for young people? How do we know that it's working? Um, the thing, the first thing that we looked at was the thing that people connect with the most. Cause like for me, I was like, you know, I feel like if we're able to just show that first part, like that that's happening regularly, that that would be good enough. But unfortunately, the things that people connect with the most, because there's a lot of stigma around hip hop based work. Um, and so the thing that people generally like resonate with people like, they, Oh, okay. Is around anxiety and depression. So we looked at stress, anxiety, and depression. Those are sort of the things that 
I'll consistently look at because that's what people think is, you know, the, the average naysayer or like person that doesn't understand, you know, when you're not preaching to the choir, um, that tends to connect with people like, oh, OK, I can understand that. You know, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so so we regularly look at stress, anxiety and depression alongside those other empowering things. Nice. OK. Yeah. So what I hear you saying is that hip hop can be used as an entry point to young people where you can, as you said, start to encourage them to learn and grow. Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, you know, help them think about uh, themselves, their place in the world, um, things that are going on for them. Uh, And then on, you know, again, there's sort of the two sides of it is how do you use existing content to have those conversations and and things, but then also giving them the opportunity to, to create themselves and express themselves with whatever's going on for them. Nice. So um, if you look at hip hop as an art form and you emerge yourself in it, um, and this is what I say to the rappers, like you, you guys have a, a lot of qualities that these young folks can use, but you don't talk about the qualities you use to create your art. It takes discipline right to create art that means sticking to it working at it every day being persistent you know the artistry of writing it takes vocabulary you know um to be able to do that it takes a lot of thinking it takes research to find out what's going on you have to sit and play as a writing as an artist that writes even if you know on eight mile the, the movie starts off with eminem like on the bus writing and jotting things down. Yeah, you can be on the move while you're doing stuff. And there's some rap artists that worked in different locations said they always had like a pen and pad. And Unless then, you're Jay-Z. Well, <laughs> you don't, yeah. You don't have to write it down. But well, yeah. he, he had different reasons why he, he, he said he didn't write things down. Um, it wasn't like, I'm just going to do this at the art form. He says he was on the go and the move a lot. And what he was dabbling at the time didn't call for him to take out something (laughs) and write something down. He had to always be aware of his surroundings. So most of his stuff went into his head, but however you write, you know, today they have the cell phone so they can just, just straight record what they're thinking. And I tell my students that that's a lot of discipline. So look at, look at your favorite artists and then say like, what did they do to get there? How disciplined were they? You know, some of these traits that they have, if you utilize in academia, you'll, you'll go further. So that's how I, I look at it. Not always just the lyrical context. Me, I would like to call myself a wordsmith. Um, and I fell in love with hip hop beat. I can't say it's not beat. It's both beats and words. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm from New York. So I, and it's this is this is known like we like harder beats, um, even if it's from the quote unquote back. Where my favorite group of all time is the Tribe Called Quest. But I tell I also like I compare the messages that are now and then. And I'm like I look for more variety. I don't mind the sexy red artists, right? But Give Rhapsody, you know, equal playing time. Let one of my favorite scenes in cinema history is when Denzel was playing Malcolm and he came and met Elijah uh, Muhammad for the first time. Mm -hmm. And Elijah Muhammad said that you have dirty water and that's the only option that folks have, they're going to drink it because they're thirsty. But if you right. give them the option between the clear water and it, then they're going to drink the clear water. Now, I'm not saying that hip hop music, you because you know, you we're human. Sometimes we like music, for lack of a better term, that's more risque and edgy. So I'm not saying songs like WAP wouldn't still not, but I think I believe it's called Ratchet. 
Well, it's a little yeah, ratchet. I, well, yeah, you can call it that. Uh, but some of I'm also I'm gonna trickle into violent. You yeah. Know? So um just I had pulled up trial call quest like the top songs you see from them is Electric Rack Relaxation, Can I Kick It Award Tour, and then Check the Rhyme, right? All of they, and I identify with them in De La Soul and Leaders of the New School more so than I identify with Cool G Rap. But I love Cool G Rap, you know? <laughs> I love to hear what Cool G Rap had, had to say. You know, um, and because I, I, he, to me, he is one of the first lyrical guys. Like my first lyrical guy that I listened to was uh, Kool Mo D. And what I'm saying is, that made me want to write in any way, shape, or form, because that's what I fell in love with. I said, "Oh, they're writing poetry, and they're making words come together, and they're sophisticated and." I watch it all. Yeah. You know, I watch these battle rappers um, that I think are amazing. Folks like Tay Rock, Sue Surf, um, all of these different guys. Uh, Easy to block captain. I I watch it. I listen to it all. My favorite artist right now is a, he he's underground. Um, his name is Sky Zoo, and so I. But the reason why I resonate with him is because I'm not saying my life was exactly like his, but what he talks about is who I surround myself with people who have that same conversation, right? So I might take the time off to look. I love, and these are artists that some people might not know. I don't have time to explain them, but Conway, Westside Gun, Benny the Butcher, I love those guys. 38. I love the artistry that they have because I'm at the end of the day, I'm a wordsmith. No matter what you rhyming about, uh, uh, unless it's something too vile, like, you know, sexual assault and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But if you're rhyming about what you did as a drug dealer and what have I'm able to compartmentalize that. But the art form itself has helped educate me, if you understand what I'm saying. And so what I try to do is say, tried to reflect upon my kids is utilize hip hop to help you. You know, um, I'm not saying take away the enjoyment from it or, you know, dance to it, have fun to it, do whatever. I work out the hip hop music, but I'm saying if you take some of the elements of your favorite artists and, or the traits of your favorite artists and you put that into your life, then I believe that Hip hop will work for you and then enhance you in ways you wouldn't even imagine. I agree with that. And I would just add what I enjoy about it is the storytelling. That's why I can appreciate artists like Nas and Jay Z and Biggie and um, Slick Rick. Did I say Tupac? Um, I just enjoy, even back to um, the beginning. Hill, your Sugar Hill Gang, thank you. Um, you know, it was, it was, there was always a story. So I, even if I don't connect with, um, with, with the lyrics, I, I still appreciate the double entendres and the, like you said, the, the way they put the words together and the, yeah. the way they make the words rhyme and the similes and the metaphors and yeah, the language I mean, art, it yeah. really takes a it, it, it really takes a lot of talent to do that and if you don't if you can't appreciate that sit down and try to write a rhyme yourself it's not as easy as they make it seem you know what i mean so that's what i really appreciate about hip-hop and not just the lyrics but it's a culture I'm into fashion i like the fashion i like the dancing i like the you know it's a whole cultural situation that you can really um, tap into and appreciate. And like you said, chew up the meat, spit out the bones, take what you, you know, take what you can use from it and leave the rest. Because a lot of people will just be turned off by, like you said, the violence or, you know, sexual themes or, um, you know, things that are salacious. They may not, uh, they may be turned off by that, but if you can be open-minded and just appreciate art for what it is, it's just like 
looking at a painting by Basquiat. Some people may see it as just a bunch of random, you know, paint strokes, but other people, if you just look at it for what it is and appreciate it, you know, you can get something from it. So that's kind of how I look at hip hop. Yeah. And artists, like, if you don't know who Basquiat is, artists can bring that out. That's the education too. True. Like they speak on one of my favorite artists is Joe Button. And, you know, he's a podcaster now. But when he came out, his album didn't do so well. But if you look at the albums, like he was really talking about mental health before anybody was talking about mental health. And I'm not just talking about other musicians. I'm talking about just outwardly open. Like he was way ahead of his time, like 20 something years ahead of his time, really. Because mental health, well, mental health it became something since probably like 2014, 15. So maybe like 10 years ahead, ahead of his time. And um, the labels had told him, I remember reading an art, an article in Rap Pages. The labels had told them like, kind of like, and I'm paraphrasing, steer clear of that. You know, and I remember his comment is like, well, you don't want to talk about my mental health, but it's okay if we talk about drugs and gun violence you know mental health is really like what i'm trying to work on but you're promoting and i remember when i was dabbling in the music industry and i had went up to where we go i think it was arista or what's the one that Celia wrong electra one of those two uh, i went to both but one of those two and then the a and r or uh, was the spanish kid who was super polite and super cool and he says man i'm gonna be honest with you <laughs> if it don't got niggas bitches and hoes on it we don't want to hear it oh my you know? goodness they're not gonna hear it i said really he said yeah man and he told me what he listened to he said i don't listen to that stuff like that but you know i'm this is my, my job and responsibilities um and i'm not saying i don't i don't blame i'm not one that blames what's going on in society on hip-hop music i'm not one of those um but i do say artists when they're pressured you know sometimes can be complicit in their outrageousness and sometimes like i expect a person like jay-z not to use the word nigga gratuitously um and he and i'm i'm a huge fan he his heart you said you expect for him not to yeah, not to. Like, just use it unnecessarily. Do you? And yet he does. Right. That's yeah. what I'm saying. But but then he showed that he doesn't have to, too, on other songs. You know, so... Did you ever see the movie American Fiction? Yeah, I saw it. Okay, that's what it reminds me of. What you're saying is what American Fiction is about. Right. Yeah. To make money is just just mm -hmm. what's going on right now to make money. And I understand the role that capital plays in society. And I, I get it. So I, I'm not too strict on these artists um, today. Um, I thought I in my class, y'all, I play because I have a class, Gender, Race, and Media. So I'll play Shake Your Tail Feather by Diddy Nelly and Murphy Lee. And then I'll play on my thought shit by Megan the Stallion. And I usually have just women in this class. I might have two guys. Right now in my class, I got one black male, and he's the only male in the class. I got one black woman, and then the rest are white and Hispanic. And they'll say, um, on my thought shit by Megan the Stallion, is she has more agency. So she's controlling the narrative in the picture where um, Nelly, Diddy, and Murphy Lee are the artists. And they're saying and looking at these women and they're, they have the agency. And But I told them, you, there's ways you can research the video and see who was the casting person. Casting person for Murphy Lee and Diddy and Nelly was a woman. The the fashion, the choreographer, the character, all these women played a role in the video that was going on, but 
still men looking at woman megan's video was way more raunchy than uh nelly dilly N nelly diddy and murphy lee but the 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 women didn't see it that way because they looking for onus like as long as we're doing it for ourselves is good when y'all are doing it for us is not so that's the message um that's a little hip hop in, in my class. That's the only time I really get to teach it, actually, I, in the class. I think that's important. Like, I think that's why it's, it's, it's individualized. Like, you can look at the same thing as I look at and get completely different things out of it, you know. And the 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 women's empowerment piece is, is huge, you know. But at the same time, I think... That's why I always come. I can't tell you what to listen to or what to watch even, but I, you can still put it back on the individual. And, and you know, I, I always my famous thing I tell to every young person is whatever you are looking at, just ask yourself two questions. What can I learn and how can I grow? And if you keep yourself accountable to those those questions, then it's you that are taking accountability and what you take out of it. You know what I mean? Um, and, and I think that captures it, right? If you're doing, how many times do we do that as black people, right? What can we say about ourselves and talk about ourselves and, and critique ourselves, but other people can't do that. Right. You know what I mean? It's, and I think it's the same thing around gender, you know? Um, but, but there's still, you, we can still ask that question of, okay, like how, how is this helping us move forward? And, you know, is there, are there things risky? But that's the whole dynamic about, you know, anything that's empowering can be risky, right? So I can feel, I can do things to help me feel better about myself, which is not objectively a bad, a bad thing, right? But you then have to ask yourself, like, what am I doing to help myself, to make myself feel better? Am I putting somebody else down? Am I stepping on somebody else? Am I exploiting somebody else? Am I telling everybody else they suck? You know, and that's what, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. so I think we we always have to ask both questions, you know, like, um, I, like I'm a lyrical person too, in the same regard, but I also know what, if, if people buy into certain messages, I know that I know the negative impact. I'm old enough now to, have seen what the impact of people buy into certain messages and ideas of what's okay. And, you know, I have a daughter now, you know what I mean? Like I have kids. I, 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 I know the impact. I work with kids forever. I know the impact that that lyrics can have if they're not contextualized or if people are only thinking about now and not thinking about the future. Um, and so I, I think, I think there it, it's important that we really interrogate, you know, what what how we are using the culture, where it's showing up, um, and and be mindful of like what we're giving a pass to and what we're not giving a pass to. Yeah, that's well said. Yeah. You got any other questions, Kim? Dr. Travis, your PhD is in sociology or you say uh, urban planning? I have a doc my doctorate's in public health. Public health. Okay. Yeah, community health. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing how you connected that to public health. It, it makes you it makes you kind of consider hip hop. I mean, or how can art or hip hop be a public health issue? Uh -huh. But I think, you know, you kind of kind of established that today by saying, you know, we're using hip hop as an entry point to, you know, um, help young people deal with, as you said, the, the stress, the anxiety and the depression and the all of the other issues that young people face as they learn and grow. So I think that's yeah. great. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you bring up a great point of like, we have to simultaneously think about the individual and the community at the same time. Um, you know, what is the desired endpoint? And and, and y'all started it off great in the beginning of this, you know, talking about Harriet Tubman and thinking about 
you know, us as a people, what is going to help us move forward. And, you know, hip hop culture is, and I always talk about it, it's just the gift that keeps on giving, you know, it's a, it's a renewable resource Mm -hmm. Um, and it's ours, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's something Mm -hmm. that is firmly entrenched in the culture. And so why not figure out the best ways to utilize what is organically a part of, of us, you know, in ways that can help us move forward. And kudos to you for doing that. Yeah, yeah. Thank so thank you, man, for coming on. <laughs> Give it up to uh, Dr. Raphael Travis. Um, it's been a long time. I've been trying to get him on, but he's a busy <laughs> individual. I get that because I understand the world of academics. So, man, we want you to come back again, man, be a voice uh, for our podcast. We definitely need that. And I definitely, like I said, I got to make my way up to St. San Marcos and Austin to check you out. Yeah, no doubt. One last point, and you'll get this more than anybody because I do podcasts and talks all the time, but you'll get this more than anybody. So when I fell in love with hip hop was at a block party where I heard Freedom from Grandmaster Flash the first time when Clay was DJing the block party in the middle, in the field, in the middle of the old section. Remember that grass that was mm-hmm. there? That That's the singular moment that stands out in my life. Wow. That's interesting because if I had to think of mine, what it was, that was the first, that was my first favorite hip hop song was freedom that whole thing i was like yeah. and that that was my first fa- favorite group you know um so there's different times you're right in hip-hop where we can say like our moments um but um i have to think about that and come up with that myself but yeah that's a good time so all right brother we will see you soon definitely man we'll have you back on before school starts up again in the Fall. Thanks for coming by. Right up. Thanks care. for the invite, y'all. All right. Peace. Well, that was an interesting conversation. Definitely. You know, uh, he is uh, very educated. He's definitely an intellectual, um, proud of everything he has accomplished because mm-hmm. he grew up in my neighborhood. My, my brother was the best man in his wedding, like him and my youngest brother. Uh, close friends, and then he graduated with my other brother. Nice. So he was, yeah, Kassan and Tyre is a stepping stone, like in age. Like Kassan just turned 51, Tyre is a turn 50 in October. And Junior was in Kassan's class, but very, very good friends with uh, Tyre. So I remember um, I taught them one of their dance routines when they were in the pop contest. Uh, oh I should have talked about that. <laughs> so that, wow! So you started that, from the bottom, and now you're yeah, here. Yeah, <laughs> we you know we. I've I've known Junior since he was five. Um, yeah, wow! So, so it's 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 a long time. It's great to have people, you know, like we had your home girls on, you know, that you go way, way, way back with. I mean, it's great that you both um, are doctors. Mm. Yeah, he was part of the inspiration for me because he he been had his PhD, and he went to some phenomenal institutions. Not that I didn't, I did too. Mm-hmm. But he went to UVA, then he went to University of Michigan, then he went to UCLA. So yeah, I wonder if he knows my husband. Uh, Ryan's older than him because okay. Junior is four years younger than me. Okay, got All it. Right. So, you know, Those are great schools. Yeah. And let us move on. Oh, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Yeah, what's going on? What's going on? Oh, what's going on? What is going on? Yeah, what's going on? Let's jump right into this. Uh, Congressman David Trone spews out a racial epithet. Instead of saying bugaboo, he said jigaboo. But he did apologize for his statement that he, he made. Um, he says, uh, what did he say? While attempting to use the word bugaboo in a hearing, that's a budget hearing that they had in Maryland, 
I use a phrase that is offensive. <laughs> that word has a long, dark, terrible history. It should never be used anytime, anywhere, in any conversation. I recognize that as a white man, I have a privilege. And as an elected official, I have a responsibility for the words I use. Regardless of what I meant to say, I shouldn't have used the language. And I apologize. So that's like we were talking the other day. We, you know, to to the to our mm. listeners out there and our viewers, uh, Kim and I had a discussion. Like, I was thinking, should we even use this as a story? You know, he apologized for it, but then another story triggered behind that. So I'm gonna let her. What other story? Well, uh, well what you said about said story. I we had another conversation triggered behind it. I okay. said, should we let this go? You know, and then you said, what did you say? I just feel like he said it himself. This is a word that should never be used by anybody in any situation. And I just feel like out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So who you I First of all, who even uses the word jigaboo? Like I would never even think to you because that's not a word that's in my lexicon, that's in my, you know, vocabulary. And so I just I just don't like the fact that he so easily used this word. And I said that I have never inadvertently or accidentally used a racial epithet um that that I know would be offensive to another race of people. So so I, I, the only thing I'm going to give him credit for is that he did acknowledge that um this is a word that should never be used. So he did acknowledge it and he apologized for it. So I will give him credit for that, but what else is there what else is there to do with 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 that you're not calling for him to leave his congressional seat, are you? No, I'm not. No, okay, he doesn't so have to really, do anything. I, I, I think you're saying should, no harm, no foul. Well, listen, he's running for Senate. the United States Senate for the state of Maryland. Right. I'm not supporting. I wasn't supporting him from the beginning. I'm supporting Angela also Brooks for okay. U.S. Senate. For this so scenario, say you if, were but, supporting. But if I, if I were supporting him, I might think about no longer supporting him, especially when there's another candidate that um, that I like more. Well, well no, 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 no. There's another, you, an, no. another viable candidate. Wait, 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 wait. So you're saying you like him the most out of the candidates. If he had that slippage, you're like, no, nah, I'm not going to vote for him. I, um, honestly, it would depend on the totality of the circumstances. So, I mean, I, I would just go, go by. He just had the circumstances. He was at a budget meeting. He meant to use the word bugaboo. No, no, no. But well, what I'm saying is it depends on what else he has done in his political career as a politician. Okay. Well, let's assume that you were going to vote for him. So let's have the assumption you already did that research. If that's who you were going to vote for in our given scenario. And then he makes this you know, little slip up. Does that deter you from voting for him? Possibly. Okay. So my, uh, uh, my take on it is like, it's a slippage. Um, if you look what he was trying to say in it, and I think I have that too, uh, Something has to be done that's absolutely outrageous. In government, business, businesses don't make decisions on investment. Trone says, so this Republican, and he used the word jigaboo, that you know it's, it's the tax rate that's stopping business investments. It, it's, it's just completely fault, faulty by people who have never run a business. They've never been there. They have not a clue what they're talking about. So he's saying, so this Republican bug, bugaboo that you know, it's the, it is the tax rate that's stopping him. 
So he used the word jigaboo instead of bugaboo because jigaboo in that context doesn't make sense. And jigaboo is, for those who don't know, it's a negative term for black person, you know, that was used way, way back in, in the day. But the words are close, bugaboo, jigaboo. So, you know, in his mind, he's saying that he made a mistake. I believe in forgiveness. I don't look at that as something huge. I don't even think he intended to say that. I think that word was in his head. And just because it's not in your yeah, That's my point. But, well, hold on, hold on. Why hold is it on. in your head? We can't control what's our thoughts. Yes, you can. No, you can't. We you don't. Absolutely we, ha can. we have things. You can't right control your thoughts. No, you don't control all your thoughts. You have things that run through your mind every day. You do control your thoughts. You don't control. So, Kim, it's almost like you said he didn't slip up. He meant to say that. That's what you seem yeah, like. I, you're I, I said what I said. I no. said what well, I said what I meant. But I, that's, I that's, said what I think. What no, that's I said my interpretation was, of it, though. I know, but I'm telling you, you can't interpret. I'm telling you what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Nothing's going to come out of your mouth that's not already in your heart. And so what I'm saying is that that's why I, I don't see myself ever slipping up and accidentally saying a, a, a racial epithet because that's not in my heart. That's not in my heart to use a racial epithet that would be offensive to another race of people. Like in our in our I just don't in our production like meeting, so, I talked about a racial epithet that could be said like if I'm talking about honking the horn and I use the word hunky instead of honk the horn, that's a slip up. I didn't mean to say that. Now, if you're saying that word is in my head, yeah, there's a lot of negative words that's in my head because I've it's learned. It's kind of like a Freudian slip. Right. OK, but that's what I'm saying. Like people make mistakes. I don't judge. like I'm not perfect, so I don't throw stones in a glass house. I never do that. Because I've had a slip. It might you, not you, have been racist. You think racist. I'm saying I'm perfect? Is that what you're it's, is that what you're implying that I think I'm perfect? No, I you're 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 implying that he has to be. No, I'm not. I all I said was again, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yeah, I mean, you do so believe I mean, in such see, a thing so as if a I said honky, if, if I said honky instead of honk the horn, that's 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 what I, that's what I meant to say. I meant to use the word honky. I'm talking about cars, and I meant to be, he's talking about taxes, and he meant to say a black person's name. It just it that, uh, that that's okay. well, I mean. You do what you well, you won't get a chance to uh to vote for this guy, but I will and but I you mean, weren't voting for him anyway. I weren't I, right, I wasn't no. gonna vote for him. I, I'm I'm vote. not saying anything like that. I, if you vote for him or not, that's your only vote. You said there's a sister in it, so I understand that. And he's being supported by some um black congressman. He's being I mean, supported yeah. by Hakeem Jeffries. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's he he's he's a so he does have some black support, but right. So do you take that in consideration? No, people can do what they want to do. I told you, I already told you who I'm supporting. I'm supporting my soror. No, no, I understand that. I said, would you take that into consideration, not on who, who you voting for, in the context of him? Would I take what he slipped up and said? Or yeah. Who I'm supporting did you, could, I didn't get that. Could you try again? Okay, that's Siri. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do take into account what people say. Yes. I thought so. It's like you talking to Siri. I and like I more. said, it's a it, it it's a totality of the circumstances, though. Right, I but mean, that because, would be. And totality. I do believe in forgiveness. Like we we forgave Biden for saying that if you don't vote vote for me, you're not black. Yeah. I mean, people say things, and you consider the and he meant totality that totality of the circumstances. He like, he meant that when he said. He, that. But he did apologize immediately. But he meant that though. That wasn't no slippage. This was a slippage. Right. All right. Yeah. Nope. You don't get a pass from me. And let us move on. Okay. This is a wild story. Um, the New Yorker first covered it. And if you get a chance to read the article from the New Yorker, um, that is something that is huge uh, that you should check out if you can.
the scandal of Clarence Thomas's new clerk. All right, for those of you who don't know, uh, Clarence Thomas hired Crystal Clanton as his new law clerk. She went to George Mason's law school. And in 2015, um, she uh, she said something on her text. She sent the text to a friend uh, that worked for her, worked with her. And the text says, I hate black people. Like, fuck them all. I hate blacks. End of story. And and like they said in the New Yorker, for most young lawyers sending such a text that's you know has been found out, it indeed would have been the end of their story. Like nobody would have hired them. But amazingly, uh, Clant- Clanton is on the cusp of clinching one of the most coveted prizes in American legal system. In the past, Clanton has risen through the ranks of conservative legal circles the story of her alleged racist out outbursts has been curiously transformed into a tale of victimhood so there's a new narrative going on with her is that somebody hacked in to like her phone and sent these false tests um and that's the story they're going with but reporters say and some judges say it's an outright lie um, they're saying like sh- she's trying to claim that she can't talk about it because she signed the NDA and the judges say, I don't know anybody who would sign the NDA if, you know, they made uh, racist statements. You know, she said that the judge says it doesn't make sense. So uh, Jeannie Thomas, which is uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas's wife, um, was kind of jumped on with her and was her supporter where she was at this and I got to get this right she was at a organization I'm thinking it's called Turning Point let me yeah that. right it's a right wing yeah. she was the national field director for the right wing group Turning yeah. Point hard USA. right youth group Turning Point USA um, yeah it's a nonprofit yeah USA it's a nonprofit advocacy group closely affiliated with Donald Trump's presidential aspirations in 2024, is well known for poisonous rhetoric. Its leader, Charlie Kirk, has recently denigrated Martin Luther King Jr. as awful, questioned whether black pilots are capable of flying planes, and argue that televised public execution, perhaps by guillotine, should be held in America with young people watching. So this is the leader of this turning point. And it says that Jeannie like supported her while she was with turning point and is a supporter of um, Charlie Kirk. So this is getting vile to me. Um, And then, you know, she came to live with uh, the Thompsons um, for like, I think six to eight months. And then, you know, fast forward to today, they kicked her out of Turning Point, though, because of her text messages. And there are people in Turning Point USA says she did write those text messages. So but she's Clarence, saying she doesn't remember. She's saying she doesn't recall. So, but when they, but, asked, but when they asked her, um, like, can you deny writing them? She didn't say no. She couldn't say no. And then she's well, telling people to refer to her, her attorney. Okay, but in in her defense, I guess to be to be fair, she told the New Yorker that they do not reflect what I believe or who I am. But for her to say I don't remember sending the text messages to me, I would be like, no, I didn't send those text messages because I don't talk like that. I don't use that language. That's not what I would say. You know what I mean? Like Okay, so you say in fairness to her, that's what she says. In fairness right. to her colleagues, they the, it was at least four of them they talked to. They said she is the author of the text. Right. And I'm, and I'm sure they still have the text messages right. to prove it. Right. right. So yeah. in, in the, or else the New Yorker would not have reported right. it. So my whole right. thing with Clarence Thomas on this is I mean, everybody says you you are a self-loathing black you 
the fact that your wife deals or works with somebody like this guy, Charlie Kirk, who I have no idea who he is, but these are the things that are being said in the New Yorker, mm -hmm. right? He has a right to his opinion. You know, Martin Luther King is awful. I'm trying to figure out, would I be closely tied to somebody that said Dr. Martin Luther King is awful? And I don't know. I can't say I, I would or wouldn't because it doesn't Because if you told me next week, you know, because a lot of people are going to say he's awful because of his infidelity and the tapes they have of his, you know, his sex outside of marriage. And some people will deem him awful because oh. of that. But I'm not, I'm sure he's not saying that this, well, I don't know why. I don't want to speak for him, why he's saying he's awful. Um, but then we should have public executions with a guillotine and we should have it televised. That's a vile mind. And and she worked at this organization, right? Yeah, she worked with, with the Methodist With which he was affiliated, right. So, right. And that's so your wife. Many, right. And so despite all of that, Clarence Thomas hires her as a law mm -hmm. clerk. Mm -hmm. I mean, students have had scholarships uh, revoked for having negative uh, text messages on their social media accounts and things of that nature. So people mm -hmm. have lost more. And she went to law less. school after these text messages. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I think, yeah, they... Yeah, right. they brought her in. Yeah, and they they when she lived with them, she they convinced her to go to law school. And he wrote a letter of recommendation because this is what's his name? I can't pronounce the the former Supreme Court's name. Scalia, Scalia, uh, Scalia, huh? Scalia. 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 Yeah. So he that's the law school at George Mason, Mason. that she went to. Right. That he wrote Korea. for her. Right. He's saying that her name is defamed. She he's running with the new narrative. She didn't write those things, right? That's what he's running with. But dude, you it, it it's sickening with him. It is. It comes to the point like you really hate it. Seems like you really hate that you was born black. But even if you hate the fact that you were you're you were born black. Does that mean if you were white, you would hate blacks? You you understand what I'm saying? And he'll and he'll it he just keeps going and going like to do things that most black people, I would say most black people <laughs> wouldn't imagine doing. No, I mean I I feel like I could I it it would be even more understandable if if he were white and hated black people as opposed to you're black and you used to hate black people. To me, that's worse. That's even I mean, worse. I'm sure he'll say he doesn't, but I'm really trying to get the truth on this guy. Like, come on, man. Well, we don't, why would you, why, why would you hire, can... why would you hire this person? There's several right. people you, exactly. Yeah. But that's consistent with who he is and how he has ruled on the, on the court. So, I mean, he, I think a lot of his, other to stuff end affirmative was... action. I mean, after he used it, so yeah, that's consistent with who he is. So it's not surprising. Yeah, I, I, this is a step further, though. I hate black people. I mean, fuck them all. Like, come on, man. That's not this. That I, I, I understand the affirmative action stance, but this stance is you're backing someone who spewed uh, uh, hatred rhetoric, and you always say it's not about that. Like you justify affirmative um, action by saying you don't want to be stigmatized. Like that's the only reason why you got into the school. And he admits that it worked for him when he was at Yale, but he, he got upset afterwards when he didn't get his job. So now he's that, but this young lady, this is her text message. And she worked with a poisonous uh, conservative group. Well, here's the thing. He, he and doesn't... they kicked her out. <laughs> Clarence Thomas has demonstrated to us that he does not care about appearances because I mean I can't say that no 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 he doesn't care about appearances because he accepted these extravagant gifts from Harlan Crow he was not concerned about the appearance of impropriety on the the country's highest court 
And this is consistent with that. He's not, because if, if, if I had a, a, an opportunity to hire a person like this, uh, Miss Clanton, who it, there's a question about whether or not she sent these text messages to me, that's an appearance of impropriety. Even if you couldn't prove that she did it, I would not want to hire someone who has that cloud of suspicion or cloud of uncertainty over them about whether or not they in fact hate black people. I would not want to be associated with that. I don't care how qualified this person is, how well they have done their job in the past. I would not want that appearance of, of that kind of rhetoric and that kind of hate being a part of my office or my chamber as a, as a Supreme Court yeah, justice. I, I would say those oh. improprieties has nothing to do with his intellectual acuity. I think that he... What? I think that those acts of impropriety has nothing to do with his intellectual acuity which affirmative action does. Affirmative action, he feels the same. You weren't smart enough to get in here. You're only here because you're African-American. Those gifts that he got does not reflect upon his intelligence. Well, and let he's me always been big something. about that. So that's a, the answer. But let let me award. explain something about a, a law clerk, because I, I actually was a law clerk, U.S. District Court in Maryland, federal court. A law clerk is responsible for writing the judge's opinions. Right. Okay. Now, if you hate black people, right, I don't want you writing any opinions that could, that probably will affect black people in yeah. this country. I didn't just argue so against that's a that. Problem. I didn't argue against that. I'm for you on that. Why would you take anybody in who has? Right. I don't care if it was a black person. I hate white folks. I'm not going to hire you exactly. if you have hate in your heart, period. Exactly. So I, I get that. And I'm on exactly. that stance. Well, why do you keep doing stuff like this to, to be shocking, to remain shocking to you? Like he, there, there's, there has to be a movie about this cat later on in life. Somebody has to play like, and, and to really get into where he has a book out. Um, Bomani Jones read it. I need, I, if I had the time, I would read it too. Cause I'm the makings of Clarence Thomas. Like, I, and, and and this is more about Crystal Clanton. She shouldn't be a law clerk. No, period. she should be. She nobody shouldn't have earned this. She shouldn't have earned this this position. Right. I, I just I don't. I think we agree that. on that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I don't know. It's. Uh, let's see how this pans out, plays out. Let's see what the news folks say about this this week unless it was reported last week but when you bring up the next topic i'm gonna take a break real quick while you bring it up okay okay i'll be back in 10 seconds and let us move on All right, we uh, will start talking about a biopic about Shirley Chisholm, um, played by Regina King. Regina King, uh, who is an Oscar award winning actress, um, played the part of Congressman Chisholm, who was running for the president of the United States. And this was a good film. I think it it, it showed a different side of Shirley Chisholm. It showed um it it was truthful. Like she um was very bossy. Um I don't want to use that negative you know, because people say if it was a man, you wouldn't call her that. I would. Um, I would say more controlling, even though she let folks run her her business. I mean, her campaign. Um, I think it, it looked into deeply who she was. And like anybody's life, it is not all 
peaches and cream. It's not all roses and flowers. Um, as human beings, we are flawed. And I think they did a good job showing, you know, different aspects of her life. Um, and some of the, it, it made me feel uneasy, especially like the relationship she had with her husband. And uh, the scene that really was riveting to me is when she said, but it's my money. Like she said that. Like, I knew you were going to react uh, yeah, to that thing. <laughs> I'm saying like, to me, when you say that the love, where's the love? Me? That's that the love, the money shouldn't matter, but it mattered to her in that time. So that was one of the, I was like, wow. Her husband was trying to be supportive. And it showed a lot. I think they didn't go into details that much, but they showed small things. Like after they had that interview and they were holding hands on the couch, as soon as they cut that interview, you they saw that the separation hands of hands. So you knew something was going on. And I like when he came down and gave her, I think that was a checkbook. He said, you're right. It's your money. It's your campaign. So why would you pretend to care what I think? Yeah, but I think what she was, she was just simply trying to take the money out of the equation. So in other words, because I think she was just determined to finish this campaign. And he tried to say, well, you know, we don't have any money. We're running out yeah, of we money. We spent $20,000 right, of right. our own money already. And so I think she was just saying, take the money out of it. Don't worry about the money. It's not about the money. Like we're trying to win here. And that wouldn't and, be reversed. And on top of that, and on top of that, it's my money. So don't worry about it. In, in other words, no. I'm not asking you to come out of your pocket. So and don't Mary. use the money if I'm willing to, to spend the money and invest in me. And that was the other thing. It's like, do what don't you that? believe enough in me to want to invest our money into? My if I looked at that, if I'm looking at that, there were several signs that said to her, you should get out of the race, right? You should get out of the race. She went to places and only captured like 1% of the vote. You know, it's just like, uh, what's her name? Uh, Nikki Haley. Like, yo, you, you lost in South Carolina, homie. That means the people in your state not even voting for you. And you didn't just lose. You got trounced in South Carolina this year. But I'm going to wait for Super Tuesday. And Super Tuesday was blooper Tuesday to her because she got trounced on Super Tuesday. She won one place. Uh, I forgot the name of that island of, of some place <laughs> that she won the vote. Um, so to me, looking... I want to say this from a cinematic, from a movie standpoint, I read an article that's from the USA today and it was all asking, was this fairy tale the true? And all the questions they asked in the article were true, that the answer was true. And let, let me just read through some of them. Did, did you know that lady who played her sister is her real sister in real life? Oh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Her name is Rihanna King. Okay. All right. So did another congressman really confront Chisholm about pay? That was yes. Um, did Chisholm and her sister really have such a distant relationship? Yes. And they also said she was the relationship with her other sisters were frosty. And one came down to her funeral, but the other didn't. Um, they, they said it was frosty because of what they said in the movie. The dad gave her a little bit more money. Um, mm -hmm. did, did she push back on the agricultural assignment? Yes. Uh, was her relationship, what was her relationship with Barbara Lee? Well, Barbara Lee spoke at the end of the film. Um, did Chisholm really visit George Wallace? She did for 15 minutes. Uh, did some of... Chisholm's allies really switched support. Yes, they did. So all of these things, did Chisholm really run for president to be a catalyst for change? That's what they said she said. So all of these things that, and it was a good article in the USA Today, they wrote about. I, well, what, I, was I, the, what was the answer to that last one you said? Did she run to be a catalyst for change? Yeah, she yes. said, yeah. 
Right. And that was the point that I was going to raise. Now, you said there were several signs that predicted that she should bow out of the race. But I was just going to submit that that is why she stayed in and finished because she saw the bigger picture. And this movie kind of caused me to to go down a rabbit hole. Um, and I researched a little bit more about Shirley Chisholm. And she said in an interview, she said that she believes that one day there will be a black woman as president of the United States. But first, what has to happen is that a black woman will have to be vice president first. And lo and behold, what has happened? And so I think that she had the foresight to see that it was necessary for someone like her to, first of all, be the first black woman and only black woman in Congress at the time. I mean, it takes a certain type of courage to do that. And so I believe. How, how, does, it take, thought, hold on, hold on. how does it take courage to do that? She was in a black district. Well, but, but did you see that she was surrounded by all those men for one and white men? Yeah. She was surrounded by them and they were not oh, you're welcoming about to why her. She was in Congress. Right. And they okay. were not very welcome, welcoming to her. Yeah. And she talked about in interviews, this is outside of the movie. She talked about interviews. I mean, she talked about how in an interview, she talked about how she would go to when she was in Congress, she would go to lunch and nobody would sit at the table with her. And mm. she accidentally sat at the wrong table for because they would sit like with their state. And she mm. sat at a Georgia table and the white guy came and was like, you, you at the wrong table. And she had to deal with, with all of that and eating yeah. by herself every day. And I mean, it, t it takes a lot of courage to endure that. There were, I, there, I, I saw another, now there were other black people in Congress when she well, was there. Well, there were black men though. Yeah. There were five, five black men yeah. out of so 430 the strong, something Congress people. And the she strongest the thing she woman. said to me in that movie was like, where are the white women and where are the black men? Like I'm a woman and I'm black. Like right. why am I not getting supported from them? But I don't know. Her, I, I'm not going to say she was bullying or anything like that, but she had her own mind. And sometimes that doesn't mesh. I like that she kicked the guy out for going off on the white guy. You know, um, I, I, I like that she got rid of, you know, she's taking the stance for the individual. Um, but I, mm, and then they showed it subtly how her in um, the, the role that, uh, Terrence, what's his name? Terrence Howard. Terrence Howard. I always want to say Witherspoon. Because <laughs> uh, there is a Terrence Witherspoon. Uh, he plays sports. Mm -hmm. But Terrence Howard, you know, and her wind up getting married, right? At the end. Did you see that? Oh, no, I didn't see that part. Oh, you didn't? Mm -mm. Oh, oh, okay, my bad. <laughs> um, it wasn't in the movie, though. Oh, really? The, okay. It was, it was in the credits they said it. Oh, wow. But I'm okay. saying subtly they showed it when she walked by and they embraced hands. Mm -hmm. So they didn't get into the minutia of her situation with her husband. Mm -hmm. You know, but that, you can kind of see, yeah. Yeah. But it was so a little frosty. But like yeah. he said, she wanted a man who could be in the shadows. And he was he was okay with doing that. And you could tell that. That was yeah, the kind he, of man that he, she needed because said, she was Don't. just a strong, she was just a strong-willed person who had a very yeah. big personality, and she was, as she said, unbought and unbossed. Like but you're not. I, I still don't. don't do. I don't excuse people for that. That's nasty the way you treat people that way. I don't give a f. You can't be that about? way. You can't no, because you, you, you like it's almost you're justifying her behavior of how of her treatment of her husband, and when her husband said. Don't get mad at me if I play that role too well. You know, like you call on me, like when things go wrong, you call on me and like right, kind of blame me for stuff. She was attacked physically yeah. and, and he was not there to protect her. And so she yeah. felt like he wasn't protecting her. And he said, well, I was in the shadows where you had basically asked me to be. So like, it's hard picture. to have it both ways, but yeah. yeah. I mean, it was so I'm just saying these things I wouldn't have known about Shirley Chisholm. You know, um, she was but a fighter. She was courageous. What was what? that? 
I was going to say, was you can't be. A, she's courageous. Right. You can't be. I, I don't think that she could have done that if she were a shrinking violet. Like you have you, to be. You're you going to the opposite end. She didn't have to be a shrinking. You can be one at both. You can be strong and you still can treat somebody nice. You I don't see. Who was she mean to, though? Her husband. Her husband. That's what made me vibe. Yeah. How, okay. How was she mean to him? She, to me, emasculated that brother. And he was willing to take on the role of an emasculated man in that picture, in that in that movie, in, 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 in their relationship. That's how I look at it. And she emasculated him by... The, the money scene was one. The money scene was one. But she was earning a salary. That it doesn't she, matter. Y'all are together. You married him. You know, you just saying like, I'm going to do what I want to do with my money because it's my money. That's what you're saying. And that's emasculation to me. No, I think Same thing that, when a man does that. And that's be little, the problem is that if she had the, she had the agency, she had the resources. No, they had the resources, supposedly. And that's when you have resources, you but can make those. If you in holy decisions. matrimony. Because it's like, you're not saying, dear, I want you to cut me a check for 35000 She's saying, I'm not asking you to cut a check for 35000 Like, we can still do this because I have the money. He said, we all, he said, we already used $20,000 of our money. Okay. Right? Now, right. you want to go and use $36,000 or more. That's what he said. So in his mind, it was their money. She made it plain like, nah, it's my money. That's the emasculation part. Like, you don't earn this income uh, uh, as much as this income. Now, he was a worker. He made money. We don't know how much he made. We know she made $42,500. But I don't think it's fair for you to say that he was emasculated because he was volunteer. He was in a relationship that he wanted to be in. He said that. He said, I'm happy to be in the shadows and play this role that I'm playing. And then he also said, you're right. This is money that you have access to that you can spend. So, oh, but you, 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 you didn't read that that way because he came down. He was he ran upstairs. And got that checkbook. Now, he was against her with that money. She said that he ran upstairs and got that checkbook. You even hear the, the, the foot thumping in the, in, in the background. <laughs> him going upstairs and then him coming down to show how quick it was. She hand, He handed the checkbook, which probably was a joint account. I can't say. But he got the checkbook. So that means he had access to it. I'm not going to say she. he went to her purse and pulled out her checkbook. I'm going to say he pulled out the checkbook that it seems like he had access to. And he was like, you're right. It's your money, right? Because it's it's your campaign. She basically was saying, yeah, everything is you. I don't have a role in this. You done kicked me to the back of it. I don't have an opinion in it. Now, when she says stay in the shadows, I'm thinking he just saying like, for the pictures and everything like that until it was time for him to come and take a picture when she was married. Cause they did the interview together. Like right. he still helped her out with that. I'm just saying. And then let me say this, what made it clear to me, the treatment could have been worse is the fact that she got divorced from him in 77. And then she connected with old boy, Terrence Howard. I don't know how long after I got to look at the credits again. Mm -hmm. And then they lived the rest of their life out together until 2005. Or yeah, 2000. try to try to look at it from her perspective. You're saying that she emasculated him, but imagine how she felt when she is uh, embarking on this gargantuan task of running for president as a first black woman. And it sounds as if her husband, the person, the person closest to her does not believe in her vision. Like he can't see the vision because she, I mean, imagine that she would need you. You need support. Like she's the only black her. woman in Congress. I disagree but, but, with you. But I know, but what I'm saying to you is consider the fact that maybe she perceived that money issue coming from him as being, it's not being supportive of her vision. 
Like she I, wanted him to. I support. To, you I support. Know what I, mean? I support. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? Though? I do understand what you're saying, but what so, I'm saying at the same time, I he supported her. He stood by her side. No, he, but if you're saying you're not going to let me finish, I'd let you finish. Let me finish this thing, actually, right? Go ahead. No, I'm just saying. But if you're boiling boiling it down to a lack of money, which we actually do have, we have the resources. Then, to me, maybe from her perspective, you're not supporting the vision. You're not seeing what I see. And, and that's what I need from you in this moment. I need you to support and, and say, how can we get it done instead of telling me why we can't get it done? And and then that one reason of why we can't get it done is money, which we actually do have. So that's all I'm saying. Just consider it from her perspective. She's not emasculating him. He is not supporting her. And in fact, supporting our community, the black community, because as you can see, if it weren't for Shirley Chisholm, we wouldn't have had a Carol Mosley Braun, a, a black female senator. We wouldn't have a Kamala Harris. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, so, I don't understand that. So that's not true. I don't believe that. I don't believe that we wouldn't have had other black people because if it wasn't for her, I don't believe that somebody would have been the first because somebody is always the first. She just happens to be the first and she was trailblazing for them. So it might give them the courage, but that doesn't mean we would have never had black people come up behind that. That statement I totally don't agree with that we wouldn't have had. We don't know what we would have had. That's so what you I'm don't saying. think so. You I said she was help. trailblazing. It definitely helped, but yeah, I'm not going to say that we would have never been in a black woman would have never been in Congress at all. That means there would be no black woman in Congress ever since she ran in 70 something. And, and we didn't have several. But, but I'm just saying, but back to what been... I tried to say. Right. When you cut me off. Right. I'm trying to say I disagree with your statement that he didn't support her. He most whole whole. Heartedly supported uh, Chisholm. He, they gave up twenty thousand dollars of their money. He made a comment because he was looking at, and he supported her all the way up to even that point. He just had an opinion in a statement that, like, why are you digging in this money? They came back to you and say, "We out of money. We don't have any money." Right. You're looking at it selfishly and say, you know what? I'm just going to take the rest of it. Now, we don't know how much more money they had in the account. I'm going to who cares if I wipe out the count and mm -hmm. I put it here. He as a husband and he's in that household. He's just like. I don't think you should do that. And he has a right to give his opinion as a husband. That's not being supportive. He, that's not we can't say because he thought about money and what was going on in their life financially that that's not being supportive. That's a voice. She claimed it over him. She didn't even say, well, you know what? I'm still going to do it. He, she didn't say it calmly. She screamed at this dude and told her and told him, that's my money. Like this ain't your money. That's my money. Right. And to me. He went upstairs and gave her the checkbook and said, you, you're right. This is your money. This is your campaign. You know, don't pretend to care what I think. Because she didn't. Well, I don't think that that's fair. I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, that's my but, I mean she was if nothing else, she was consistent because she did the same thing with the uh, the campaign manager. Remember, he um, was trying to advise her on campaign strategy. And she said, no, we're not doing that. And he said, well, why, do, why are you bringing me in to advise you if you're not going to listen? And she said, I, I hear what you're saying, uh, but we're not doing that. In other words, and then remember she said, you, he, he got fed up and she said, wait, you're still going to advise me, right? So in other words, she can hear your perspective. She can hear your advice. But at the end of the day, isn't it her final decision? She said she wasn't going to go to California. She wound up going to California. She said California was a waste of time. Right, she didn't really I'm want just... to meet with the Black Panthers, but they told her the girl was saying, why, why are you not meeting? Right. With... So what I'm saying, a lot of things she did to me within her own campaign was flawed. Her saying not listening to her advisor, right, right. to me, was flawed. 
right? But she said, um, you still want to advise me, right? right she right, wanted she did, the advice. She, she, yeah, she still wanted it, but she right. still wanted to do what she wanted to do, right? Well, isn't that what we all do? Not in the marriage. You consider not the in the marriage. You consider what somebody else is thinking. That's why I don't. You can't. To me, mm. I'm never going to say he didn't support her because he did. So he speaks up for the money, and now we're saying that, you know, he wasn't being supportive. No, he was. He was just saying, "Hey, I don't think we should go past that point." Like, homie, you're not winning. You're not winning. They told you the numbers. So he's like, "You're just basically giving that money away." And then look what happened to him. And then the thing about it is she got, I didn't like this, what they did to her. But for some reason, they did, those two black men did not, Walter and Ron did not support her. Right. They turned on her and they betrayed her. We don't know why that happened, but it happened. Could have been because she was stubborn and had an attitude. We don't know. But whatever they did to me, it was wrong. I thought that was wrong. Gloria Steinem didn't support her either. This, you know, self-described feminist. And again, she's like, well, I'm a woman. Like, why aren't you supporting me? But I just happen to think um, racism. When Gloria Steinem came up on the page, page when they showed her actually, because that was actually Gloria Steinem when they showed her. Yeah, yeah. What were her comments? I was near the refrigerator when she said. I can't remember what she. I can't paraphrase. remember what she said, but she didn't. She wasn't supporting her. Of Shirley Chisholm. Right. She was supporting one of the other candidates. Was it another? I would woman? have to. I would have to go back and listen. No, Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm was the only woman in the race at the time, wasn't? Yeah. Yeah. I forgot wow. who she was supporting, but it wasn't. Shirley Chisholm. And I, yeah. I remember that because I was like, wow. Because you would think a feminist like Gloria Steinem. Her statue, yeah, would hey. support any woman that was in the race. Mm -hmm. But she she did. Nah. It, 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 to everybody listening, it's definitely... And a, Regina King was amazing. She, I mean, she really captured, you know, I mean, they even had the teeth with the little gap in yeah. A little gap in it. Me and Felicia like, was talking about. She said, "How?" I said, "They could have put a veneer over her tooth that was that way, right? That made it the gap." So, um, and she had the little lisp and the kind of the accent because she yeah. she was raised in Barbados, and you could kind of hear that in her speech. Yeah, yeah, she did a good job, but she's you know she's always been talented. To me. Yes, indeed. And let us move on. Okay, this is a follow-up to the HBCU president uh, was at Lincoln University in Missouri. Uh, he was reinstated after an investigation found no claims of bullying after administrator's death by suicide earlier this year. Antoinette Bonnie uh, Candia Bailey, a university alum, um, and the vice president of student affairs died on January 8th. She accused President John Mosley of bullying, harassment, and discrimination in a letter according to ABCs. Um, and then he said, there's a lot I can say about the independent report and its findings, but I'm grateful to the board of curators for their faith in me and their vote of confidence. Uh, he said that Thursday, the board advised me of the report's findings a week ago, and I've had the time to reflect to discuss my future and the university with my family and members of the Lincoln University community. I care deeply for this university, its mission, our students, staff, and faculty, and I look forward to returning from the administrative leave to resume my duties as president. And this is, this is from Yahoo News. Yes. So I, I, it sounds like you may have been right, because I think when we talked about it before, you were saying that I think your position was that there's really no proof that she was being bullied. And um, so I guess this investigation has revealed the truth, which um, it appears that there was no bullying. And it was a black judge who did give the ruling on it. Um, 
And I'm I'm gonna like to think that the board of investigation investigators, you know, were mainly African American, giving it that it is, but that's not so always the case um, at a historically black college and university. Sometimes race takes on things, and what I'm saying by that is that there's a possibility that we took the race of both of the people involved in this situation, being the president and the VP of student affairs, we took that into account. But remember the first time we talked about it, she was struggling with some mental issues that she said she was seeking help about. Mm -hmm. And um, her perception, or she could have been perceived that this gentleman was bullying her, but they let her go because of some things that she did um, with uh, students, uh, well, I should say non-students, um, giving them dorms and different things. So they kind of did an investigation on her and they let her go. And we haven't really heard support from other faculty members. Um, some, but mainly students. So, Yeah, um, it sounds like this may have boiled down to just one party's word against another party's word, because in her letter to the president, she said, I couldn't even, she was citing a meeting that they had, and she said, I couldn't even finish the meeting because you didn't hear me. I left in tears. You intentionally harassed and bullied me and got satisfaction from sitting back to determine how you would ensure I failed as an employee and a proud alumna. So this was her perspective, and this is how she felt. But apparently, after an investigation, they didn't agree with her perspective and how she felt. So, again, this seems to have boiled down to her word against everyone else's word. Mm. And you can't really, you can't really control how someone perceives something. And like you said, she was struggling with her mental health and this is just how she received it. It drove her to the point where she ended up um, dying by suicide. So we don't know if that was the thing that drove her to, she was, dealing with a lot I remember what they said you know is she had on she had been there that long you know um but I think it was contributory to it I do agree with that um but, but I, one of her I, I, feel sad. Kind of- I feel sad for a situation like when someone losing their life yeah. over something to me like this um I just wanted to know that they know she was stable or not. Cause I think if they knew they would have handled this differently, they probably would have gave her a leave of absence until she can come back and figure things out. Yeah. Well, hopefully her death is not in vain and they will take that into account so that this does not happen again. Yeah. Let's, let's, mm-hmm. let's hope that that happens. All right, so. And let us move on. But I heard that. Some people don't like the way. You know, I got something better for him. So, come on, ride the train. I think this is an appropriate song for the topic that we are about (laughs) to discuss, Freak Neck, The Wildest Party party Never Told. Um, Those of you who don't know, it is on Hulu right now. It only had two commercials doing the whole thing, and it was about two hours. Mm -hmm. You could check it out. 
But Did they, you notice they, that some people called it Freak Nick and some people called it Freak Neek? I never heard it called it Freak Neek. It sounded I like... I always um, heard Freak Nick. I never heard Freak it Neek. Sound, I, I, it sounded like Jermaine Dupree called it Freak Neek. Uh, I didn't hear him say <laughs> that because it's okay. Picnic. And so right, right. That's what I thought too, right? So it's... Um, I think it was it was good. They showed the history of what the intentions are. It started off as just a party at P Mount Park, a cookout really at P Mount Park for those who couldn't afford to go home during that time. See, these students don't know about that. The Atlantic uh, the Atlanta, Atlanta, Atlanta University Center. Huh? The students from the Atlanta University Center, right? All yeah. the, the schools in that, that area. That, well, a lot of people, they, they get a big drawing from across the country. So if you're from San Francisco, I can understand why you might not go home for spring. Right, right. You know, um, but if you for... So yeah. it was, wait, Spelman, Morehouse, uh, Morris, Clark, Atlanta, uh, Morris, Morris Brown. Brown. Yeah, yeah, all that the... Was, that was the Atlanta University site circle right mm-hmm, there. Mm-hmm. Have you ever been down there? I have not. Okay, yeah. Have you? Yeah, I have. Yeah. I've been I never went to Freaknik year. either. Did you go to Freaknik? One year. Really? What yeah. year? Early. It was early. It okay, was, so it was before it got really out of control when people were being sexually assaulted and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh I mean, the later it got at night during the earlier years, you've seen that, but not at the level that they were showing. Yeah. Yeah, because it it got out of control. It started out quite innocently, and it was when it was all college students. It was that, but that's how it happens. The neighborhood comes in and want, 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 want. You know, yeah. I just I don't know. There's no diss to down south or down south at all. But sometimes when I went down there, the way some of these like during the day. The men are so respectful to the woman, but when it comes to certain environments, then they just turn into other creatures sometimes. This is totally not my scene. I I, I never would have gone to anything like this just because I don't really like big crowds like that. But you, you probably would have went to the earlier ones, though. No, where you still could drive. I don't, I don't like having I don't like being in a space with like all those people like that. It's just oh, like in a park. Right, it's just too many people. I just, it just makes me a little bit nervous. Like I don't, because I think about um, the Cedric the Entertainer joke when he's like, one person starts running, then everybody <laughs> starts running, and you don't know what's going on, and it's like you could get trampled. Like I just, I don't like, I don't like feeling like I'm that much out of control. I don't like you, that. I don't like control. that much today. Um, but if I'm going to an old school hip hop concert, because they have this place down here called Cynthia Woods Pavilion, and it's an outdoor concert thing, mm-hmm. and you have the chairs, and then you have you know the lawn, and a lot of people opt to go on the lawn because it's cheaper, and the stage is just still right there. You still can see the people. Right. It's not really far back. Mm-hmm. But I like sitting in the seats um, because there's a tent over it, and um, a canopy in if case it rains, right? Yeah, if it rains or just if it's too hot, hot, right? Yeah, um, so I and I'm used to, I always, when I go in, I always have exit strategies, and I always tell people, like, you know, tuck your shoelaces under <laughs> the bow of your shoelaces under your shoelaces that's on your tongue, you know what I'm saying? Yeah the lines that go across because one thing that's bad if your shoelaces come apart somebody step on them it can send you to the ground right you know um but you know just always be be prepared but when you with old crowds if there's a fight it's just gonna be a fight ain't nobody <laughs> running <laughs> unless they hear gunshots because <laughs> this is a fight it's like oh i can't move like i used to <laughs> but I mean, listening to the stories about it in the beginning, they they didn't have to worry about that. They said right. it was just people out having a good time. There were no fights. There was no violence. There were no gunshots. And so, you know, that 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 was a good thing. I'm I'm glad to hear it, that. It was the Olympics that really stared it wrong, though, because they didn't want the, these black folks down 
They didn't, you know, the shops, they didn't want them coming to the shops. They didn't want them to scare anybody that was um, tourists that were going to come to Atlanta. They wanted to, quote unquote, clean Atlanta up. Prior to that, like, Freaknik was bringing it a lot of money. It was bringing the city a lot of money. But as the, the some of the students said in the documentary, they didn't have a problem with the white kids that would go to Daytona Beach and Miami or wherever they went for their spring break. Right. It wasn't the same issue, you know. They weren't talking about it, uh, but it became a problem at those places because there were a lot of sexual assaults that became on, but this was later on, way after Freaknik. Um, I think it was more so they're right. There definitely was a racial component, but the fact that it was a city and not on a beach is different, you know. Um, like, well, they did stop traffic a lot and have you know, right. wall to wall traffic. Yeah, <laughs> so, you can expect that sometimes, but they could have put the cones out and directed traffic. If you were freak Nick, you got to go down this aisle. You can't go down the other. If you stop here, we're going to confiscate your car. Blah, 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 blah. Um, but they, remember they, the story the lady told about how she couldn't go to her house because they wouldn't let her off that exit yeah. without an identification. I was yeah. like, wow, that was yeah. too much. It got crazy. Like yeah. that, didn't, that didn't make sense. <laughs> no. they, I, I'm with the, the, the student that said they should have just canceled it. Right. If they would have canceled it. No, none of us would have came down here. But you're gonna have it, and then try to like, what? What's the need for this? But check it out on Hulu. Um, it is Freak Nick. Um, and tell us what you think about it. Right in. Use our email to write in potlickershow at gmail dot com. Tell us what you think about Freak Nick uh, and what's going on. All righty. And let us move on. Here we go, yo. Here we go, yo. So what, so what, so what's the scenario? Here we go, yo. Here we go, yo. So what, so what, so what's that scenario? Hey. hey. So this is where we play Am I Tripping Game? This is a game that was created by Reese Colbert, and you can get this game at amitrippinggame.com for about 20 bucks. All right, you ready? Here we go. All right, I'm taking it from out of the middle. We invited our friends to a double date at a fancy, expensive restaurant, and they showed up with their toddler. As much as I love their kid, I think it was totally inappropriate to bring their kid without warning, especially to a place that is obviously not meant for children diners. Am I tripping? No, I don't think you're tripping. Um, I think the family that brought the child is tripping. <laughs> Um, and the reason for that, because there's no forewarning, if it's like, look, you know, Timothy's sick and we can't make it out. He just got this cold. I mean, we, we don't have nobody to watch and we can bring him, you know, uh, but if we can't bring him, then we're going to have to <sighs> see y'all a different time. I think that's the courtesy that's owed to the group who invited the family who invited you out. Well, I I don't think you're tripping because if your friends invite you out to a double date, first of all, why do you even want to bring your toddler on a double date? You know, like when you're going out on a date with another couple, I don't even know why you would want to bring your toddler because, you know, toddlers can be distract. They can be busy and they're going to distract you and you're trying to have adult conversation with the other couple. I can see if you were just by yourself. If it's, it's a, just the if two it's of you like, and you want to bring your child, that's fine. But you're going on a date with somebody, a double well, date with yeah, another this couple. Is, that's, this is what I would say. If they're both married, the couples are married, and they've yeah. known each other for a while, and now they have an 11-month-year-old baby, bringing the 11th 
month of your baby if they're going to sit and quiet, be quiet. It's nothing because nothing you say at the table, they're going to be able to comprehend. You know, you think so, you really think an 11 month old is going to be quiet the whole day? Well, no, I'm saying like you, it depends on your child. You know, um, mm -hmm. if you bring the bottle of the food, look, I don't put kids, to, babies to sleep with all kinds of noise. They'll go to sleep. They'll be in church and they'll be asleep. You have to know your child. If your child is teething, then no, you ain't going to bring him because he's wild now. But if your child, you give him a bottle and he going to sit there and just and, <laughs> and laugh like that's fine. See, the problem is they showed up with the child. Yeah, without Instead of Right. They could have done that at home and been like, is it okay if we bring so and so? Yeah, no they could have been like, yeah. they could have been like, you know what? Yeah. Let's not if you if you have to bring the child, you know what? Let's don't worry about it. Let's it turns yeah, it, it turns your sexy. It turns your sexy into regular conversation. Like right. if you want to turn up and have conversation, even though the child can't comprehend, you don't want to be telling salacious stories at the table with the baby right. there, that's not going to put you in that type of mood. Right. Know? And if they couldn't get a babysitter, just don't go. Like, yeah. put it off to when you can get a babysitter. Yeah, so that's I don't think she's thing. tripping. She's not tripping. I don't think so. We agree on that one. Okay. Wait, wait hold on one second. That one down. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay, my friend and her co-worker have been flirting with each other for months, but they never went out. One day, I tagged along with her to a work happy hour. Wait, did we do this one before? I think so. Sounds like we did. You don't I have them upside down? No, I think we... I put them in the back when I'm done. Oh, so we, we went through the whole deck. No, you said no. you just took that out the middle. Right. Okay. My ex-husband's new girlfriend posted a picture on social media with him that included our child. I told her I did not want her posting my child, so I took this as a slap in the face. A slap, a slap in the face. I confronted my ex about the post, but he refused to make her take it down. He said this was different because it was a family picture. And he would not make our child get out of every photo with his girlfriend. Read that again. because My ex-husband's new girlfriend posted a picture on social media with him that included our child. I told her I did not want her posting my child, so I took this as a slap in the face. I confronted my ex about the post, but he refused to make her take it down. He said this was different because it was a family picture and he would not make our child get out of every photo with his girlfriend. So it sounds like he would have been okay. Wait, wait, with the, and, and, is she saying, am I tripping? Right. Am I tripping? That was the last of the statements. I'm going to read it one more time. Yeah. My ex-husband's new girlfriend posted a picture on social media with him that with him that included our child. So it was the ex-husband, the girlfriend, and, yeah, their, yeah, yeah, and the child. Okay. I told her I did not want her posting my child, so I took this as a slap in the face. I confronted my ex about the post, but he refused to make her take it down. He said this was different because it was a family picture, and he would not make our child get out of every photo with his girlfriend. Am I tripping? Am I tripping? Okay. So uh, yeah, I think you tripping. And my reason is it's not just your child, it's his child too. Right. So that's why I think you tripping. Um, if it's her by herself, I guess you can say that because it's not your child, but it's him with her. I know it's just a girlfriend. Um, then my whole thing, do you post on the internet with your child? Now, if you don't post at all and the husband knows you don't post any pictures at all, he should honor and respect that. What's interesting here to me is that the girlfriend and the ex-wife 
have some sort of relationship because she said I told that girlfriend not to put my child on her social media. That don't mean they have uh, no. I'm just saying, but they they're communicate. I I that to me that's already like I don't see myself communicating with my ex husband's girlfriend. Like what are we talking about? If, I, that's that's if you got a wait, if you got a child. Right. That well, see, I think that's the issue. Like, what kind of girl, quote unquote, girlfriend is this of my ex husband's? Because I really don't want my child, our child, hanging around just a random woman. Like, okay, this is your girlfriend, but like, is this a is this like a serious enough relationship for you let, to let, be let me, let, my let, child? Let, to let me help you out, Kim, because sometimes you see things just one way. So I'm gonna turn the scenario around. You have an ex-husband now and you got kids and then you start to date. And I ain't talking about early. You've been dating this guy for like eight or nine months now. Right? Do you not let him hold your child? Maybe not. No. I mean, I, eight or nine months is not a long time. That's my point. Like, I think that's why women, I think that's why women have these what, kinds what, I, you know they said that on the joe buttons uh kind of they like telling melissa for like eight or nine months is not long it's and not, i'm like to me. i mean it's all relative it's, it's from your perspective for, for me that's not a long time to me it's how long you how much you communicate with the other person because the muslims say the, the foi farrakhan the nation of islam they said six months is long enough for you to court somebody find out if you're going to marry them or not now and i'm not going to go deep into this it is it depends on your circumstance okay but are you married if they're married maybe that's a different no, situation but that's their significant other if he's saying that's my girlfriend if they coming over to your house and you going over to their house that's a relationship but you don't necessarily want your child to meet this other person unless you are you know then that's that different. But if you significant that, that's person what, in that okay. person's life, that's you know what, what I mean? I'm gonna say that straight up then. What you say is exactly right, but then you wouldn't have the baby around. But once you feel it's okay to have that person around, and I'm I'm assuming he thinks this. Right, the the ex husband he thinks this, then it's all right for the girl to hold a baby. I think the problem in this scenario is the definition of posting a picture on your social media, because the the ex wife sees that as I should not see my child on your page. Period. Right. The husband is saying, "Why, if we're taking a family picture, why can't my child be in the picture with me and my significant other?" Right. So they have a disagreement as to what she didn't tell the child him. She on, didn't tell him that. She, she told the girlfriend. Right. Exactly. So that means I don't want you posting pictures of my child on the website. Right. And he said. Like, well, this is different. It's not her just holding her man's uh, baby boy. You know what I'm saying? It's them together, and she just happens to be holding it. Everybody going to know that's still your child? Right, but I mean, if they have an agreement. But it To me, it's the policies that you have as a woman, like yourself. If you like, I don't post my child on the internet at all. Right. And the father should know. No pictures. Don't no pictures. Don't put right. them up there until they old enough to poach. But we don't we don't know that to be true. We only know what we what they give us in the scenario. So I would say, yeah, she tripping. And I'm just saying that because that's not that's not just your baby. It's his baby too. You know, and you know, we can't. Sometimes in our mind, when we see new girlfriend. You know, we automatically paint them as bad. I don't think, I, but see, like like you said, it may not just be the issue with the girlfriend. It could be just Period. as a mother, she doesn't want her child. Right to now, if that's the case. If that's the case, the father shouldn't have had a defense and said, "Well, this is a family photo." Right. So, and I just feel like, as a girlfriend, I just believe this. Now, you never know unless you're in a situation. 
But I just feel like if I'm a girlfriend, I'm going to respect the mom's wishes. Like, I don't, I don't want no smoke with you. I really don't. I, I, I'm just a, I'm an anti-conflict type of person. So if so you don't you're want me to talk to, to child, you're gonna listen. You're gonna listen to my girlfriend. Me and you are, are together. You're gonna listen to my girlfriend over me. You mean the, my ex-wife? I'm gonna listen to your ex-wife. Yeah, you're gonna, I don't want my no ex, you're gonna listen to my ex-wife over me. Yes, because this is this is my. That tells me a lot about. But listen, you. listen. This is my social media page. I don't need to post a picture of your child. I really don't. And if the mom doesn't want it, you don't like, know. if she if she came to me as a woman, well, well, we, said, Can you please not post any pictures of my child. No problem. You don't have to worry about seeing your child on my Okay, so page. We're, we're, the assumption is she posted on her page and not on the uh, the, the, the father's uh, page, right? Now, that's if he assumption. if he wants to put it on his page, that's his business. But this woman came to me and said, could you please not put my child? I would never disregard what a mother asked me to do about her child. Like, is it that serious for me to have a picture of another I, woman's I, child I, I, on let my me page? Say this. Let me is say this. Let me, let me say this. I would. Hold on. Hold issue. on. Let me say this. I agree with you in that context, but I don't get from that card. That's what was said. She didn't want her posts and pitches, period, on on posts and pitches, period. So the mother, I don't, the mother. Cause, yeah, because why why would she even be friends with her in the first place? Well, that's what I pointed out. I said, oh, this is interesting. They actually have a relationship where the we don't know that though. We he could have so she could have saw it on her husband her husband's page. That's the card the says the card says I told her. I did not want her posting my child. This is the mm -hmm. ex-wife talking to the girlfriend. Yeah. So they are having conversations. Right. But that could be posted in on his. You Felicia put post stuff on my page all the time. He could post it. If they take a picture and send it to the A Bay, post this. I agree with you. You're a hundred percent right if she went against her word. I yeah. wholeheartedly so agree. But if if it was on, how about let, let's say we switching. Let's say because we don't know. Let's say it was on her ex husband's page. That's different. That's then between the ex husband and the and the ex wife. That's between. But she's still two. in the picture, holding the picture, they're holding the baby. That's. I think that's different. That's I that's think, gonna be between. I think, I think the issue is her holding holding. Well, like, it didn't say that. It's, did it say he was hold? She was holding the baby. No, they, she wasn't. The ex girlfriend's not. I mean, the girlfriend's not holding the baby. They just in a family picture. They just in a picture together. You don't really know even know if it's. Did she say baby or kid? Um, child. Yeah, so we don't even know how old the child is. Right. I mean, child could be five years old. Right. Right. So I'm assuming that it's a, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming she's not holding the baby. All right, the baby's so, just in the picture. The child is just in the picture. I think she, I think if it's on her, if it's tripping. on her, if it's, if she not tripping if it's on the girl's page. She tripping right. if it's on the, the ex-husband's page. It's That's where I would land with that. I agree. She, she ain't tripping. I mean, you get a right to say where you, you know, whether you want your child on social media or not. So you're not tripping. Now, this is a different one. This is one where you have to tell a story. So this says, share a true story about a time you believe someone wasn't telling you the truth and made you wonder. A true story about a time you believe someone wasn't telling you the truth and made you wonder. Hmm. I mean, that's every day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I got students. I get emails and I'm like, hmm. You know, I can't make it to class because of, uh, I got, you know, I don't, that's not, uh, that's not a good one. Um, no, that's not a good one. I think she needs more information than that. That's too broad, you know. Okay, this, let's do this one. Whenever I buy an e-gift card, I send it to my email and forward it to the recipient. 
After six months, I check to see if the gift card has been used. If not, I use it without telling the recipient. So far, nobody has admitted to noticing their gift card has been spent. So I plan to shorten the secret cutoff period to three months going forward. Am I tripping? Child, yeah, you tripping. You is tripping. <laughs> yeah, you tripping. First, Ooh, thing, I, I have say, never stop heard. Sending, stop sending the emails <laughs> and, you know, give them the damn card. This is crazy. Do you think somebody would ac actually do, do this? Yeah, this I think is, people would do it. I have never heard of this. A $200 gift card and you broke and you ain't got no money. And she thought oh, she ain't used her card yet. I gave it to her <laughs> eight months ago. <laughs> That's like first right of refusals, you know, something. You are tripping. I think you're tripping, but I've seen people do it. Are you serious? I, I swear I was today years old when I heard this happening. I have never, heard, I did not know this was possible. Oh my goodness. You're going to send but the I would send the email. I would, copy send yourself. The, I would send the email and said, I sent you this gift eight months ago. You didn't get it. So I took it back because I just didn't want it to sit in your emails and get lost in your junk. It's obviously that person don't check their emails. And I'm not resending it, you know. If if I if I'm going to spend it, that's what I'm gonna send. Now I wouldn't do that. I would have been told the person after a week, like, "Yo, I sent you an email last week with an e-gift card," or I, I'll tell them as I send it, "I just sent you a gift card." Right away, I would have texted them so they'll know. Please acknowledge that you received it. That's the type of person I am. But I can see people do that. They die like, man, I gave her a three hundred dollar gift card to give me something that uh, they don't even have. Bed, bed, bath, and body works, and you ain't use it yet. That's right crazy. back, right back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jeffrey Osborne. Yeah. But the thing is, is the person's not going to know if you spend it. If they didn't even, if they, it's almost like they forgot they had it. Yeah, but they still have the email and you don't want them to go to the store thinking the, e the, the money is there and it's not. That's embarrassing. Mm. I mean, they, in some states, they had to change the law to make the gift cards um, have uh, no expiration date because people just, you know, something about gift cards, people forget they have them and never use them. Sometimes there should be a time limit on gift cards, though. This should be. I don't I think, think so. I think 12 months should be the time you do because then you know it can mess up. You know, it's, I mean, you purchased it already, I guess. Out there, I don't think you should have five years. Like, I gave you something in uh 2020 and you just spending it in 2024 now. It happens. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I, but I, I'm saying to me, after a year, then it should go dead, and then that money should revert back to the credit card that was used, other other person it was used for something like that. Okay, my pet peeve. This is the last one. My pet peeve is being around people who never have cash. Yes, I know there are cash transfer apps and cards. But I think it's crazy not to even have at least two dollars on you at all times. Am I tripping? You tripping? You tripping? People don't care. Uh, many people don't. I care don't about think that. she's tripping. I mean, I don't know. Hate is a strong word. So if you hate to be around people, yeah, maybe you you tripping because it's understandable. But I do agree with, and I get on myself all the time about this that I I don't put cash in my pocket, and I need to put cash in my pocket. I try. I, I try to go to get like thirty dollars cash. And this is what I want to do, and I get paper clips, and I put the three dollars in a paper clip and have them and have them in my car. And sometimes when I see homeless people and they said, "Yeah, just give them three dollars." Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And then I try, try to have just cash. I don't like to tip from a debit card. Oh, you feel like you want the people to have the cash in their hand right away because yeah. then because then I don't because if I tip on Sunday, 
right, with the debit card. And then it comes out a week later, I forgot about that. You know, especially mm-hmm. if it's a big tip. Like when we went to Mastro, when I go to, I know I'm going to a restaurant, restaurant where the tip going to be like $60 or eight or something like that. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go get the cash and I'm going to put it in there and be like, boom. And and I make sure the waiter gets it. Mm-hmm. I don't even it just I- seems like cash is going to eventually be obsolete because there's so, so many um, electronic transactions that happen that are more convenient. And then, then when you have a cash- freedom, there's a freedom that goes away from that. That's like forcing people to pay other companies to administer it. So if it ever goes away, then Cash App and them shouldn't be getting money. That's how I feel. Yeah. Right. Because you, you don't have a choice. Right? right. Now you don't have exactly. Now you have a choice. If you don't want to, then you can say, well, Cash App, well, I will do it for you. You just got to pay us this percentage. The problem is, is when I have cash, like you, I, I lose track of what happened to the money, <laughs> you know, cause like you might have a hundred dollars in your pocket at the beginning of the week on Friday. You're like, wait, I thought I, I had a hundred dollars. What did I spend it on? Well, if you don't use the money in the bank, that's a good way to save. Like here's my budget. Now, a lot of people just create another card for that. You At know, least we, when you use when you use your debit card or your credit card, you can go back and trace. Okay, this is where I'm, I spent the money. But a lot of times with cash, you don't know what you did. Only people who got a lot of money don't know where they put the cash. At. <laughs> Folks who got money don't have money. They know damn well where they spent it. <laughs> now I put eighty dollars in my car and gas. I got you know a bag of funyuns and, and, and potato chips from Seven Eleven. Uh, I got a Coke Zero. Uh, <laughs> other day at Dunkin' Donuts, I got two muffins and a coffee. <laughs> you say if I don't know what happened to the money, I got I got bank. I'm you big bank. bank. Hey. You ain't worried about that, shoot. Folks ain't got no bank. When that money dwindled down, <laughs> when, that, when that money dwindled down, they know exactly where they spent that money. At. <laughs> okay, you have a point. All right. Well, that's am I tripping for the week? All right, so and let us move on like this. Keep the keep on. So today we want to highlight as our little known black history fact, Reverend Adam D. Williams. Reverend Adam Daniel Williams was born on January 2nd, 1863 in Greene County, Georgia to enslaved parents. Reverend Williams helped to establish the Atlanta chapter of the NAACP. He was described as a forceful and impressive speaker, a good organizer and leader, and a man of vision and brilliant organization. And he also just happened to be the maternal grandfather of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And if you can see his picture, that we have posted for those of you who are watching on YouTube. He favors, or Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. favors his maternal grandfather. If you could see this picture, they look very much alike. So Reverend Adam Daniel Williams is our little known black history fact. And I think it's particularly interesting that he helped to establish the Atlanta chapter of the NAACP. So that tells me that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came from a long line of public servants who contributed to the uplifting of the Black community. Dr. I would. 
Adam Kerr. Daniel Williams. Yeah. So. And let us move on. Oh, hell no. Oh, hell no. Fiery school board meeting in Virginia. So what happened? Uh, a student took a picture of a young lady, another student in the school. And she had, if those of you who are viewing this, I kill niggas, you know, but the the N is still there, but the the other letters in the word are, um, what do you call that? Uh, blurred out. And then on the other side, we have the black new Black Panther Party showing up. They said this was a long meeting. A lot of people were talking about um, hate, hatred images being passed around the school and that the school needed to do something about it. Everybody was talking about it. They talked about it for an hour at least. And the school board meeting took made the school board meeting take three hours. What say you about this? Is this a bunch of nothing or... And they only suspended the girl for three days. To me, that's expulsion. I agree. This should just be not tolerated at all in the school because this is subjecting um, students to uh, a hostile environment. I mean, they sh nobody should have to attend school where they're seeing a tattoo. And this is a tattoo, mind you. It's not like she drew it on her arm with a magic marker, right? I, I, it looks like that's what it is because they said she wrote it on somebody else's arm. So she ain't had no tattoo thing in the, in, in the, in the school and just did it. And to me, I mean, if it's permanent, it's, it's, it's horrible. But the fact that you write that on your arm is horrible. Somebody right. had to write it on her arm, definitely. I don't care. I mean, you could... How neat it was. I don't think that's upside down writing. Uh, I think somebody wrote it on her arm and then she wrote it on somebody else's arm. And I just think that calls for exposing. You should not be allowed to come back to that school. I agree. So three days is not enough. So I, I'm not surprised that the Black Panther Party showed up there. And I think that's an appropriate response. Yeah. It's, uh... Hopefully it makes a difference. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully it does. I agree with you. Um, but I don't know. We it seems like there's a lot of things that's going wrong in that school district. If you read the article that they put out, like th this isn't the first time. So they need to get stuff together over there. And, and let us move on. Give it up, give it up. So we giving it up to three A and T students uh, who have been selected as 2023 astronaut scholars. A and T is the first HBCU to have more than one astronaut scholarship astronaut scholarship available in an application cycle. So these three ladies, whom are. Uh, Christy Barnes, Maya Odom, and Brianna Robinson. Uh, so they will each receive fifteen thousand yeah. dollars for eligible educational expenses. Uh, this is a part of a STEM program that's going on. So kudos to them and uh, what they're doing. Uh, and you know, it's always. So, always good to see young people in general do well, but I do have a bias because I'm a product of two HBCUs, so it's always good to see students from HBCUs achieve. So big up to uh, Christy, Maya, and Brianna. Uh, we wish them the best. And let us move on. Somebody pray for me. Uh, 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 I done been lied on. 
boom, backstab, then mistreated. Fake love, made me hate love. You can take it back, I don't need it, yeah. But somebody pray for me. Uh, somebody pray for me. Somebody pray for me. Uh, somebody pray for me. I done been lied on, backstabbed and mistreated. Fake love, made me hate love. You can take it back, I don't need it. Yeah. Okay, you see, we have a new segment to close out. It's called Prayers Up for, and today, Prayers Up for Carl Weathers, who it's was family. born. Okay. <laughs> prayers for Carl, uh, Prayers Up for Carl Weathers and his family, uh, who passed away January, uh, I mean, February 1st, 2024. Carl Weathers was born January 14th, 1948. A lot of us know his, his most well-known role is uh, Apollo Creed uh, that uh, in Rocky. Uh, he was in Rocky 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, he played the role. Then he was uh, Action Jackson. Um, he played in that. Then he had a television series. So He's a well-known actor, been around for a while. Uh, so, yeah, prayers up for him. What, what? Do you know his estate was, um, he left behind an estate worth $815,000 to his two sons. Jason and Matthew, yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. I'm surprised. I would, I would have guessed it would be more than that. But you uh, never know. I mean, because he was in such high-profile movies, you know. Yeah, but you got to think about when those movies were shot, what the actors were being paid. He was never a $20 million a year actor, if that, you know. And you got to remember, if that's their only job, they got to make that money stretch. So I'm not mad at that. That's a lot of money. He Most of his life, he's a, he's a B actor, you know, except in like Action Jackson, you know. Yeah, but it was, yeah, those are two iconic roles. That's all. I mean, it just. I mean, he played in other roles. Like he was on sitcoms. He played in comedies and things of that nature. But I'm just saying, we don't know the extent of the check he was getting. You know, Um, I'm not, I'm, look, he was well off. $815,000 is a lot to leave behind, you know, to me. You know, Uh, that's what, 400, 400. Four hundred seven thousand and fifty seven thousand and five hundred dollars. Well, I mean, if it just people. it depends on the estate. It just depends because there could be taxes taken out depending on how he it's being transferred to his heirs. Yeah. So it could be a little less than that. But he apparently the cause of death was arterial arteriosclerosis. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, Carl Weathers, let's uh say a prayer for his family. And on that note, we are gonna wrap up the show. Okay, so our words of wisdom today was from Sister Harriet Tubman. I had reasoned this out in my mind. It was one of two things I had a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. We had a discussion with Dr. Raphael Travis, who's doing a lot in, at school with his programs um, that infuse hip-hop into helping out folks. Um, uh, what's going on? We started off with David Trone, a Maryland, Maryland U.S. rep who apologized for using the racial slug Jigaboo. Clarence Thomas hired Crystal Clanton as his law clerk. That clerk, that's the young lady who texted out, um, I hate black people. Um, and then we talked about Shirley, the movie, uh, who, who starred Regina King, which was a great movie. Y'all should check it out. Uh, we talked about the HBCU at uh, President Mosley at um, Lincoln, Missouri. We discussed the Freak Nick, played our Am Trippin'. <clears throat> Little known black history fact was Reverend Adam Williams. 
I all hell no went to the white student with the tattoo on her arm that says I kill niggas. We gave it up to the three students uh, for being selected for astronaut scholarships at an HBCU in North Carolina a and And then prayers just went up for Carl Weathers' family, the known actor from Rocky. And so, as, oh, you got more comments? Thank you, everybody, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to hang out with us. And as always, in parting, we wish you love, peace, and knowledge to feed your soul. Okay, now to feed your soul. See y'all next week. <laughs>